This month, the 4,000 mile match race to Brazil, the 160 boat fleet race in Sardinia, and a special guest turns up in China. Plus, the radical new America's Cup boat is revealed. But first, it was a baptism of fire for crews as the Volvo Ocean Race headed south to Cape Town. Until the end, until the final blow of the whistle, sound of the horn, we will fight, we will conquer, emerge victorious, we are the champions. Nah, nah. The opening leg to Lisbon in the Volvo Ocean Race was a short hop compared to the 45,000 miles that lay ahead. But it was a stressful one for the teams. The scramble to get out of the Mediterranean after the start from Alicante saw the fleet stick together. But Vestas 11th hour racing were happy to break from the pack. And their early confidence paid off. To be honest, before the leg I was quite apprehensive about how this leg was going to play out because I remember from the 2015 race how many times the whole fleet just flipped inside out and leaving out the med, so uh, you know, we knew it was important to have a, a strong strategy leaving. And it worked. As strong easterly winds provided a slingshot for the teams, it was Vestas that led the charge. Leaving the race favourites struggling to keep the pace. Until Gibraltar, all the fleet didn't sell very properly. I mean, before Gibraltar and follow stay together and make the wrong choice to go to the south and Vestas did something very simple. We all have very, very similar speed and sometimes it's difficult to make the break. So too was keeping the lead as the breeze went light. Yet Vestas kept their advantage to take the first offshore victory in the 11 leg race. It's a leg kind of unlike any other leg in the race, really, until we get back into Europe in nine months' time. So having sailed 1,500 miles, 10% of the points have already been awarded. <laughs> We're glad to have them go the way they went. An early boost for the team, and a reminder as to how tight the racing would be. This race is going to be exceptionally tight. I mean, all the teams are good. I think uh, this race is a little deeper than the last race, and then to have the uh, you know, talent from all the other boats in the last race um, kind of filtered amongst the current teams. Um, you kind of lose some of the boat speed edges that people had in the past and everybody's kind of raised their game together. If the strong breeze through the Straits of Gibraltar had thrown teams in at the deep end, the opening stages of the 7,000 mile leg two from Lisbon to Cape Town was a baptism of fire. Four days of full-on downwind racing at a relentless pace. The last few hours have been really tough. Well, <laughs> that's a bummer. Whether it's white or brown or small or big, nothing good ever comes of a cloud. You know, trying to avoid the big nose dive. I think the time of my life. <laughs> the Volvo Ocean Race was living up to its reputation. But this edition of the event also stands out for the wide range of talent and experience among the teams. Among the crew lists, some have a string of world titles. Some have America's Cup victories to their name. Some have Olympic gold medals around their necks. Some have all of the above. And one discovered he had even more. We've got some great news that's just come in from Peter Burling's parents. Um, it was World Saver of the Year award last night. Uh, Peter has won the award. He doesn't know yet, so we're going to go and give him the news. You've got to read this. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's awesome. Yeah, it's been a really cool year up in Bermuda. and oh, It's just awesome with the air collide. But no, we're just pushing hard here. <laughs> Struggling a bit at the moment, but it's all right. I'm absolutely thrilled for him. Couldn't be happier. <laughs> ever the diplomat, ever the competitor. Life offshore is Burling's new world. And he's not alone. This edition of the race stands out for the new wave of young, accomplished sailors that have joined the teams. Many are less decorated than Burling, but they're just as hungry to learn. I think the appeal for me was it was a completely different challenge. 
I love Olympic sailing, but I also find it really tough. I'm very stressed all the time and there's a huge amount of pressure on myself as an individual to perform well. I really enjoyed the team environment on the boat and uh, it just opened my eyes to something that I hadn't even considered. It's definitely daunting. I, you know, my longest offshore had been the prologue from Lisbon to Alicante, which was four days of light winds, nice weather. Three weeks plus on the boat, that's gonna be really tough. My offshore experience started in maybe June, July this year, a couple of months after the cup. I think the biggest learning curve for me has been just managing myself offshore managing the sleeping, managing the eating. So then, then when you get on deck and, you, and, you, and you're there to make the boat go fast, you can do it. I think there's massive similarities in some aspects of this racing. You know, managing your own expectations, helping to manage other people's expectations, and all of the technical skills. I think obviously on a much smaller scale, you know, it's all it's the same sport. Olympic sailing has set me up quite nicely for transition into this kind of racing. To start with, I didn't know what I can put into the team. And uh, I think slowly I'm, I'm getting there. And I've obviously done a lot of races, uh, imports and tactics with boat on boat. But I'm still uh, struggling to look out of the boat still because I'm too focused in the maneuvers and uh, making sure I do my job right. So for me, it's been a hard part now, but I think with time we'll, uh, we'll get better. And while many would agree, the benefits of an Olympic medal hasn't always provided an instant advantage. The first few days were pretty wet and windy. And I have to say, in the first day, I was like, what am I doing here? But uh, then it got pretty nice, uh, close, to the, close to the trade winds, it's always nice. Mapfrey Skipper believes there's a different reason to take these newcomers offshore. I think it's not a matter of new generation of sailors, I think it's just a matter of very good sailors. Of course, helps uh, to have people always, you know, talking in the meetings, not just listening, and people uh, bringing a new point of view, and this just open-minded, you know, is, is very important. As the fleet crossed the equator, and the newcomers were subjected to King Neptune's induction. Ah, check with you. Remember, he was a handsome man. <laughs> the racing remained as intense as everyone had expected. After ten days just 65 miles separated the front from the back of the fleet. Next month, we joined the crews at the end of leg two in Cape Town to find out how they now felt after 7,000 miles. Mexico played host to this year's World Sailing Annual Conference where plans for a new offshore sailing world championships were unveiled. The world title will take the best results from the joint ORC-IRC offshore world championships, as well as a separate long distance component selected from existing major events. An online world championships was revealed too. More on this in next month's show. The World Sailor of the Year winners were also announced. As we've already seen, America's Cup winning helmsman Peter Burling was mid-Atlantic on the Volvo Ocean Race as he received the men's title. While Olympic gold medalist and three-time Laser Radial World Champion Marit Baumeister was assured to receive the women's award. To already be nominated is already a big honor and to actually win it is just incredible. Um, especially when other people uh, vote for you, it's, yeah, it's an amazing feeling. Meanwhile, Ian Lipinski won the famous Mini Transat solo race across the Atlantic. Porto Cervo, Sardinia. Famous for its stunning scenery, but also for hosting the world's most advanced yachts and the world's best sailors. But this year, shortly after the maxi yacht Rolex Cup fleet had left, a huge fleet of small, high-performance sports boats arrived as the J-70s came into town. For the 175 entrants, this was the big one, the World Championships, and the stakes were high from the start. The class has grown incredibly. 
It has gone from a U.S. base to today, 24 countries, and you can see the level each year is getting better and better, and it's incredibly impressive. You're here with 175 boats, some of the most famous sailors in the world, great competition, and then to have it in this venue in Porto Cervo is unbelievable. But the event kicked off with controversy, as eight boats failed measurement checks and were refused entry. Illegal keels were at the heart of the dispute. Then the weather stepped in. A strong winds forced a postponement to racing for the first three days. Well, we've had a mistral that came in on Sunday, and so it stopped us on Monday, and then Tuesday we didn't have any racing, and today's Wednesday we haven't any racing. Uh, today we saw out on the course 50 knots, and here in, in the area, uh, 36 to 40 knots. But when racing did get underway, the size and scale of the event was clear. The J70 is just five years old, but it has grown rapidly to become one of the biggest modern sports boat classes in the world. After three races, the fleet was split into gold and silver. While the smaller fleet sizes made the race course less crowded, with over 80 boats in each group, the fleet was still big by any normal standard. As the scoreboard started to fill, there were several teams that were making a bid for overall victory. Peter Duncan's relative obscurity, Gustavo Martinez de Reste's Fermax, and Claudia Rossi's Petit Terrible were leading the charge in the gold fleet. While in silver, Norwegian steam, skipped by Eivind Astrup, took an early lead. Although the delays earlier in the week put pressure on the final day's racing, the weather was now playing ball. Tripping up seemed as easy as going flat out. After six races, Brian Keane took second overall, while Luca Dominici in Otatro team took third. But when it came to delivering a consistent performance, it was Peter Duncan's relative obscurity that took a podium position in every race. To take the world title, by storm. I'm on the top of the world. I mean, this is just such a great feeling to have. I mean, I've never seen so many keel boats out at, at an event. Looking back and seeing all the boats coming out was, was great. But as I said, uh, I think earlier this week, I think the Europeans have really taken in this class and are really sailing the boats exceptionally well. So for us, this was just, you know, terrific to be able to be over here and uh, have the opportunity to, um, you know, have a good event. So we're very, very happy, very happy. Coming up next, a 4,000 mile match race across the Atlantic. And a radical new boat is revealed for the America's Cup. For Northern Hemisphere sailors, November is not the time to be heading offshore. Long nights, strong winds and big Atlantic seas are not an enticing prospect. But for the 39 teams that had entered the biannual Transac Jacques Vabre, these were just some of the factors that make this race one of the most appealing and challenging of the season. Racing from La Havre to Salvador da Bahia, the 4,350-mile course follows a historic coffee trading route between France and Brazil. Among those competing were Class 40s, 50-foot trimarans, Imoca 60s, and the monsters of the multi-hull world, the Ultime class. Yet despite the difference in size, they all had one feature in common for this race. They would each be sailed by just two people. Leading the charge, a head-to-head -head battle between two of the biggest multi-hulls in the world, Gitana 17 and Sodebo. Crewed by Sebastian Joss, who won the race in 2013, and Thomas Ruxel, Gitana 17 is brand new. She's also the biggest trimaran to be designed to fly on foils. Her arch rival, Sodebo, can't fly but holds the record for the fastest single-handed lap of the planet, set earlier this year with her skipper, Thomas Coville. 
Now joined by Jean-Luc Nilia, confidence was high, but could the bright green try match the newcomer's pace? Depuis plusieurs jours, on parle de météo, donc je suis déjà dans un scénario, je suis déjà dans un, comme un réalisateur, je suis déjà euh, dans un film. Je ne sais pas très bien comment on va faire le montage, mais les, les scènes, je les ai déjà. Les conditions, elles sont, elles sont pas mal musclées sur les, deux, les premières heures de course, donc, euh, voire même des conditions qu'on n'a pas rencontrées en entraînement, donc ça, ça fait cogiter. Out into the open ocean, both crews put their foot to the floor to set a blistering pace. In perfect conditions, Gitana lifted onto her foils and took off. But her advantage was short-lived when she sustained damage to her foils. Then a tactical error allowed Sodebo to come charging through. But as they approached the finish, the intensity of the battle continued. After more than 4,000 miles, less than two hours separated the pair as Sodebo took the win. They won the cup, so now they get to make the rules. But while New Zealand is famous for its innovative thinking, the next America's Cup boat is radical. A 75-foot monohull with no keel, but with two giant canting T-foils instead. The faster the boat goes, the more support the T-foil provides. As the boat moves through the water, the T-foil on the downwind side generates lift and prevents the boat from capsizing. The weight of the opposite foil on the windward side helps to pull the boat upright too. And should the worst happen, in flight and at speed, the new AC-75s are expected to be faster than the previous AC-50 catamarans. They're expected to remain on their foils through tacks and jibes and be nimble through maneuvers. In contrast to the cats, they'll fly large downwind sails. And the early expectations are that downwind, they will fly in as little as seven knots of wind. The message is clear. The next America's Cup will be in a beast of a boat. In 2005, a group of ambitious but inexperienced Chinese sailors realized the start of their dream to buy a boat in La Rochelle on the west coast of France and sail it home to China. Five months later, they arrived in Shenzhen. Eager to share their newfound passion and develop the sport at home, they created the China Cup. It started off with uh, some boats from Hong Kong and a team of 10, uh, 40.7. And then the next year, another 20, so it is stayed that way. Now we have 250 boats of all different classes. It just mushroomed away, it just bloomed. The four-day series kicks off with a passage race from Hong Kong to Shenzhen, followed by inshore races and around the islands race. But this year, there was a particularly special guest in China, the America's Cup. We went to Bermuda to watch the America's Cup this June. We hoped that the America's Cup could come to China. Now New Zealand have won it, they've brought the trophy with them to share with the Chinese sailors and to encourage more people to learn about sailing and participate in it. We felt a bit of a responsibility as new trustees of the Cup to try and promote the, both the America's Cup and sailing to, to China. That's why we're here from the Royal New Zealand Yacht Squadron as well, is to, to promote training. Um, we'd love to train more Chinese kids and get more people in China into sailing. Which is good for sailing and it's good for the America's Cup. But the America's Cup was not the only celebrity in town. Three crew members from Emirates Team New Zealand were racing in the Beneteau 40.7 fleet. 
having never managed to win the class, despite three previous attempts, the Kiwis were keen to put that right. We're racing in the Beneteau 40.7s, and it's a big fleet, we've got about 26 boats, so that's, that's a big one designed fleet, you know, and the, and the quality's really, really good. It's great for the young guys to be up here and get some international experience racing on the boats and stuff, and, and we're also helping the young Chinese sailors improve as well, so, you know, it's just a great thing to be a part of. Light conditions continued until the final day when the breeze arrived. By then, a showdown was in store. After the penultimate race, the Kiwis had pulled level on points, taking the racing down to the wire. Despite the pressure, Emirates Team New Zealand sailed flawlessly to take the final race along with the overall title. It was a fantastic day. We went out there and had a bit more breeze in the last few days and, and managed to get two great races. And, and for us, we sailed really well and managed to win the event, so we're super excited. Racing was also close in the IRC A class, with Standard Insurance Centennial beating Alpha by just one point to take the class win. And in IRC B, the local team aboard Seawolf delivered a flawless performance, winning all six races. We're quite happy because, you know, the China Cup is our local regatta, and we are local team, and we win the race, of course we are very happy, very pleased. But Emirates Team New Zealand's participation wasn't just focused on the silverware. The objective for us being up here is to, to compete in the China Cup and, and do well, but then also to go around to the schools and to show the kids the pathway um, and to show that we can help with that, but mainly to show them that sailing's a, a really viable sport for them to choose. But there was still one burning question. Would there be an America's Cup challenge from China? I would be surprised if they, if if uh, China did not uh, have a go at it this time round. Next month, youth worlds in China, tiny boats across the Atlantic, plus how one man took on the world.